Are you a senior citizen? Are you a person with a disability? Are you low income? Then this program is for you. Welcome to a program featuring interviews of state and federal candidates and incumbents from districts serving Clatsop, Marion, Polk, Tillamook, and Yamhill counties. I'm Heather Wechter, Advisory Council member serving on Northwest Senior and Disability Services Advisory Councils. I want to welcome candidates, incumbents, and Advisory Council members to the 2018 Candidate Interview Forum, which is sponsored by our Senior Advisory Council and our Disability Services Advisory Council. Northwest Senior and Disability Services is a local governmental organization that provides Medicaid Oregon Project Independence, Older Americans Act, and grant-funded programs. The mission of Northwest Senior Disability Services is to promote dignity, independence, and health, honor choice, and empower people. The assistance and support we provide to consumers include information and assistance, in-home and community-based services, financial and medical help, meal site and home delivered meals, options counseling, adult protective services, Medicare counseling, peer mentoring, money management, as well as health and wellness programs. Because of the number of state legislative districts that our service area covers, we have invited a large number of candidates to our candidate interviews. Each candidate has been given information on the format used in these interviews. Each candidate will be introduced by a member from the advisory councils. Then each candidate will have the opportunity to answer the same questions, which will be timed. That way you, the viewer, can compare apples to apples. We thank these candidates for their willingness to share their views about services for Oregon seniors and people with disabilities. Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Plowhead, and I'd like to introduce you to Governor Kate Brown, incumbent Democratic candidate for Oregon Governor. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. Yeah, we're going to talk about people with disabilities and seniors today. And so, um, what are your top three priorities for seniors and people with disabilities? Well, Oregon has been a national leader for seniors aging in place, mm -hmm. and in order to keep that promise, I think it's critically important that we invest in reliable transportation, stable housing, and affordable health care. That's why as governor I was so proud to work with Republicans and Democrats to fund the most comprehensive transportation package ever. We've invested in public transit in communities across the state, mm -hmm. and we're prioritizing projects for seniors and people with disabilities. Then we've also worked hard to make sure that we secure funding for the Oregon Health Plan. Mm -hmm. This is really important because that helps secure funding for our rural hospitals mm -hmm. as well, and we know folks living in rural communities really depend on those. And then lastly, affordable housing. We've got over 11,000 units under construction throughout communities around Oregon, mm -hmm. and it's so critically important that folks have safe, stable, affordable housing to live in. Thank you so much. So if elected, what will you do as governor to ensure that we have transparency and accountability in Oregon's government, specifically in areas that impact seniors and people with disabilities? Well, I believe strongly that Oregonians should know how their taxpayer dollars are being spent and how elected officials and public servants are spending their time. Mm -hmm. That's why I've led sweeping reforms to both Oregon's ethics laws mm -hmm. and to Oregon's transparency laws. I was the second governor in the entire country to make sure that every single public record request is available online, <laughs> uh, that folks around the state can see it. We've worked hard to streamline uh, agency record release uh, so that folks, public, can have easy access to those records mm -hmm. and affordable access to those records. And we are uh, making sure that that information is available online around the state or through an uh, assistive device. Lastly, I fought to make sure that we have funding for broadband access mm -hmm. in our rural communities so seniors and people with disabilities can have access to the entire world without leaving their homes. That's wonderful. 
So how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that's matched with federal funds, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, I think um, it's key that we invest in infrastructure. I talked about transportation infrastructure so mm -hmm. that folks can get to their doctor's appointments, spend time with their grandchildren or grandnieces and nephews, mm -hmm. uh, making sure they can spend time with friends. I think affordable housing is also key. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I think it's really important that we build uh, with this uh, upcoming a baby boomer generation, which I am a part of, mm -hmm. that we build a really strong caregiving workforce. Mm -hmm. I fought in the early 90s for family medical leave so mm -hmm. that parents could stay home and take care of uh, ailing relatives without fear of losing their jobs. I believe absolutely that we need uh, paid family leave so that parents can stay home and take care of their sick parents mm -hmm. or their children that need help. Thank you so much. What are your plans to improve vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities access to nutritious food necessary for maintaining their health and independence? Well, seniors without adequate nutrition, their health is impacted, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. impacted immediately. So I think there's some really important programs out there that we must continue to invest in mm -hmm. and fund. And the Oregon Food Bank is one of those programs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, last year as governor, I took my entire team uh, to pack food boxes for the Oregon uh, Food Bank. We had a great afternoon and learned a lot. I also learned at the food bank that because of the Oregon Health Plan and the fact that we're covering over a million people, mm -hmm. that, um, that is, health care is no longer the primary reason why people are seeking access to the food bank. Mm -hmm. But that's not all. There's a federal program, uh, Senior Farm Direct, mm -hmm. which enables uh, seniors to access vegetables and fruits mm -hmm. at our local farmers markets. And I see this as a win-win uh, for both our seniors, making sure they have adequate nutrition, mm -hmm. as well as our local farming community. Everybody benefits from having access to this healthy uh, food products. And then lastly, we're doing some really creative work around the CCOs, the community care organizations, mm -hmm. and these are the service organizations providing health care to vulnerable Oregonians. And they have flexibility in their dollars, but they're working to make sure that uh, seniors have adequate nutrition, mm -hmm. stable housing, and all the things that improve medical outcomes. Thank you. What has motivated you to run for governor? Um, that's a really great question. I got into public service because I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. um, I got cut my teeth at the state capitol mm -hmm. advocating for women and families. I've continued to fight to make Oregon a better place for all of our families. But I had a lesson in one of my first years as governor and that is uh, we had a fabulous uh, trainer come assist us with how we're looking at uh, human services. Mm -hmm. And she shared with us the story of uh, wheelchair uh, accessibility in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it was wheelchair advocates who built on ramps uh, to sidewalks. And that was really start of a movement, right? Mm -hmm. But her lesson from that and my lesson from that if we build sidewalks mm -hmm. that are accessible for everyone, mm -hmm. it benefits all of us. It benefits uh, kids that are on in roller skates. It benefits parents who are using strollers mm -hmm. to cart their children. People mm -hmm. are going to the bus or light rail with their suitcase. And of course, folks in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And so that lesson for me, and this is my fight as governor, is to make sure that we're serving our most vulnerable Oregonians and that when we do that, everyone in the state will benefit. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been you. wonderful talking to you. Nice to see you. Keep up the great work you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. This has been Governor Kate Brown, Democratic nominee for Oregon Governor. I'm Stephen Manessis. I'd like to welcome Patrick Starnes, independent candidate for Oregon Governor. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate coming. What are your top three priorities for seniors and people with disabilities? Well, health care, independence, and dignity. And I would say that as all of us depend on the, our greatest health. So that gives us 
uh, when we're in great health, that uh, gives us strong uh, independence. And with that independence, we, we gain a lot of good dignity in our lives. Very good. If elected, what will you do as governor to ensure that we have transparency and accountability in Oregon's government, specifically in areas that impact seniors and people with disabilities? Yeah, I'm, I'm the only candidate in the governor's race that's talking about campaign finance reform and also the transparency of where the funding comes from. Mm -hmm. I'm the only candidate that's uh, limited my donations to $100 per person so that regular folks can donate to, to uh, my campaign, uh, even if it's less than 100. Um, and the reason I'm role modeling campaign finance reform is because if we get big money out of politics, especially in healthcare, then we're gonna have better services for our seniors, disabled, and even our kids, you know. Thank you for that. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Yeah, I'm a little cautious about the word prioritize because usually that means are you willing to cut one service in order to fund another service? Mm -hmm. So I'm dedicated to funding all services. And I'm, I understand that the Medicaid funding uh, from the feds is gonna be reduced over time. Mm -hmm. So we, we really have to step forward to get more funding, stable funding for healthcare and for you know seniors and disabled folks along with our kids and schools. Okay. What are your plans to improve vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities access to the nutritious food necessary for maintaining their health and independence? Yeah, as you know, uh, food and nutrition is the key to our health care, um, along with exercise and physical therapy. You know, there's a lot of activities. Uh, there's folks can do uh, therapy in the pools, in swimming pools and stuff, even if they're disabled. And so health care is affected by our nutrition. So I'm completely dedicated to programs like Meals on Wheels and other uh, nutritional uh, formats for seniors. I'd like to see a farm to fork program where we have our local farmers in the communities helping feed our seniors and disabled with local nutritional food. Okay. What has motivated you to run for governor? Well, besides my over 10 years of uh, volunteering on school boards, I've been elected three times to school boards over, over 10 years. I would have to say my mom is a big influence and she worked for the Oregon State Department of uh, Senior and Disabled Services and my young nieces and nephews, you know, so it's, it spans many generations. And my mom is especially was a uh, eternal, excuse me, an eternal optimist. It's, oh. I'm, I'm getting a little emotional about it, talking about her, but uh, she was an eternal optimist and, and she's given me that kind of outlook that we can always do better in Oregon uh, than, than where we were before. His, I'm a history major, so I know how terrible things have been and I know how bright our future is by working together and cooperating together to make Oregon a, a great place for all vulnerable populations. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate welcome. your interview. We appreciate your being here and sharing yeah. your perspective. I'm looking forward to talking to more um, of your allies. Well, thank you. This is Patrick Starnes, independent candidate for Oregon governor. Hello, my name is Reed Headland. I'm here this morning with John Furbake, Republican candidate for Oregon's first congressional district. Welcome, John. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Reed. And good to be here. All right. Well, if you were to have a mission statement for the position you are seeking, what would it be? Um, I have three points. Uh, constitutional rights, uh, the freedom to believe. That's what the flag stands for, and all the other rights that separates us from a Soviet republic. And then the second item would be uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, not only light rail investments, but also roads uh, that people can move around better. It's good for the economy. And then the third point is good health. Uh, there's more to good health than a good healthcare system. I think we are blessed with very good healthcare in America, but there's more to it than just seeing a doctor. So how will your mission statement influence the way you vote for seniors and people with disabilities? Well, good health, um, uh, you know, uh, to age, that should not be a, a problem. You know, I helped my father go to an assisted living facility and a friend of mine said, oh, you'd put your dad away. I said, I'm not putting away. 
it helped him to his new phase in his life. And the first thing that happened in the facilities, he, the nurse came with a big pill, big red pill. And he said, yeah, this, this, I have a small red pill. So I was standing next to him advocating for him. He said, yeah, that's, that seems wrong. And so it was wrong. The, the nurse said, yeah, but that was in the computer. So that with, uh, there's a lot to be, to be done and to be improved, uh, including advocacy. The Older Americans Act provides critical programs that help 258,000 older adults in Oregon. As Congress considers funding for fiscal year 2019 and 2020, how will you protect and continue to increase funding for Older Americans Act and other aging and disability programs? I think it's very important to honor our elders, take care of older people, especially people who cannot really do anything. Uh, but uh, most people are able to still function. I think, it's, uh, uh, I think it's important to not only look at tax and provide services, I'd like to work with the private sector, private individuals, and to stay involved in that community, help older people to stay in their home as long as possible. Um, and then maybe with faith-based organizations, but private sector, not just government, also private sector assistance. Okay. What are your plans to improve access to the nutritious food necessary for maintaining health and well-being for seniors and people with disabilities? Well, when I think of good food, I don't think of a government program. Uh, you know, in the military, the food, you know, we should compl hear complaints about it. And the great British baking show, it's, it's not a great American government baking show. So uh, that's, again, that's something uh, we need private responsibility. Portland has a, has a food culture. We should expand on that. Uh, good nutrition, I think, is an essential part of healthcare, also for older people. Um, I'm concerned about the, 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 the pill popping mentality. Whenever we have a problem, pop a pill. So, as an immigrant, I find it really, uh, it really strikes me as almost like a problem. All right. Well, what will you do to protect Medicaid, Medicare, and essential, affordable health care services that keep seniors and people with disabilities in our state healthy and in their homes? I think it's uh, a national interest to keep people as long in their home as is possible. I think uh, it's uh, that now with all these le different levels of care, assisted living and nursing home care, it, it's beautiful we have all that, but I do think we, we move towards a trend that you'll have nursing home care, people really cannot do anything, you need intensive care by skilled professionals. and home care. I, th I think the whole assisted living and uh, you know, the, the people that are not integrated in society, I think I like to move away from that a little bit. I like to keep people in their home and that relationship besides money uh, keeps them healthy and happy. All right. Well, that concludes our interview this morning. I just want to take a final moment just to say thank you one more time, John, for being here with us today and for your th thoughtful responses. Thank you, Reed. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to campaign and to bring issues to the forefront. I think relationships, also for all the people, very important besides just government money. And thank you for being here. This is John Furbake, Republican candidate for Oregon's 1st Congressional District. Hello, I'm Linda Crandall, and this is Mark Callahan, Republican candidate for Oregon's 5th Congressional District. So nice to see you here today. Nice to meet you as well. If you were to have a mission statement for the position you are seeking, what would it be? I believe my mission statement would be to have an open door policy to everyone. I'm, I am a Republican myself, and, but I know that if I, when I get in there, I say when, um, very positive attitude type of guy, uh, I said, I, when I do get in there, I'm going to be representing everyone. That includes Republicans, that includes Democrats, that includes Libertarians, Democrats, uh, Green Party, w whatever, Independents as well. And so my mission statement uh, for this campaign and when I get into office this November is to have an open door policy for everyone. Thank you. How will your mission statement influence how you vote for seniors and people with disabilities? My mission statement will influence how I vote for seniors and, uh, seniors and those with disabilities is the fact that 
One thing I really pride myself on is listening, listening empathetically. Not just to listen, for, to wait for someone to actually get done with what they're saying, but actually to listen to them empathetically. One, another thing I've found is to actually look them straight in the eye and be genuine about what you're saying, genuine about listening as well. So listen empathetically and being genuine about it and keeping to your word too. There's a lot of uh, people back in Washington DC right now that don't keep to their word. And um, I've always grown up with values of honor and integrity and character. And I'm, I'm definitely a type of person I keep to my word. I'm an Eagle Scout myself. And I think honor and integrity and character is very important and then keeping your word as, as well as listening empathetically. Thank you. The Older Americans Act provides critical programs that help 258,000 older adults in Oregon. As Congress considers funding for fiscal year 2019 and 2020, how will you protect and continue to increase funding for Older Americans Act and other aging and disability programs? Well, coming from a single parent home myself and uh, watching my mother uh, deteriorate over the years of Parkinson's disease and then also my grandfather passing on and my grandmother here passing on, in addition to my dad passing on as well from Agent Orange that he picked up in Vietnam, I think uh, caring for seniors is very, very important. In fact, I was actually working at a senior center in college when I was trying to put myself through college at Oregon State University. So I, I was their uh, administrative assistant. I would organize the activities. And so what I would do in Congress is basically vote for anything that supports our seniors and vote for anything that supports those with disabilities because seniors are important to our society. Seniors and those with disabilities do, are valued on our society because they have something to offer. They have the wisdom to offer. They have, even if, they're disa even if people are disabled, you, you still have those people that are valuable to our society and we shouldn't just brush them aside. We should value them and take, advan take advantage of that value because they can offer that to society. Thank you. What are your plans to improve access to the nutritious food necessary for maintaining the health and well-being of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities. Well, one thing I, I helped coordinate when I was working at that senior center was at Oregon State University is the Meals on Wheels program. That is an excellent program. I know my grandparents also used it when they were living, and uh, it's a great program for seniors that can't or don't have the ability or or, or don't have the um, yeah the ability to go out and uh, grocery shop. And I, I think it's just a great program, and I would encourage uh, keeping that program in addition to s expanding on it, uh, depending upon senior needs of what their nutritional needs are. So I am a big supporter of Meals on Wheels and any other nutrition program that uh, serves our seniors and those with disabilities. Thank you. What do you do to protect Medicaid, Medicare, and essential affordable health care services that keep seniors and people with disabilities in our state healthy and in their homes? Well, I think uh, we, all, we all pay into FICA and Medicare and Social Security taxes when, during our working lives. I'm 41 years old myself. I see that come out of my paycheck every, every couple of weeks. So it's something we all pay into. We are all, we're all kind of invested as Americans in terms of paying into the Medicare system, Social Security system, and Medicaid as well, so as taxpayers. So what I would do to protect that is I would vote in favor of protecting those those basically entitlements is what they are, but we, it's something we pay into. So we're basically it's it's a government version of a savings account, and I know that uh, when we pay into it, we should be entitled to that when we get older or if, if we become disabled. Thank you for being here with us today and for giving us your viewpoint on these issues, and we really appreciate your t the time that you've taken to come to and talk with us. Well, thank you. I, I enjoyed being here and uh, expressing my views on these topics and issues. We've been talking with Mark Callahan, Republican candidate for Oregon's 5th Congressional District. Hi, I'm Judy Richards and I'd like to introduce Senator Jackie Winters, incumbent Republican candidate for Senate District 10. Hello, Senator. Hi, Judy. Tell us what you did for seniors and people with disabilities in your time in office. Do I start all the way back from the beginning? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I've been involved in the legislative process uh, since 1999. Uh, and then prior to that, of course, I served two governors, Governor T and Governor McCall. And during my career, uh, since 1999, I've been involved in helping to fund and continue the program and Project Independence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been involved just recently uh, in making certain that we actually saved the Oregon Health Plan. The Medicaid funding from Oregon Health Plan uh, was part of that work group. Uh, as well as a part of the advocacy to get the legislation through so that we made certain there was the, the dollars there in order to actually make certain we had health coverage for the uh, senior and people with disabilities. And that's quite a lot. That was quite a lot this past session. Mm -hmm. Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to re-elect you. Well, I guess if you go back through my old career, it would be everything from Project Independence to actually uh, the work group and the legislation that passed that, that actually uh, uh, we did the same that we did for children, and that is to ha make certain that the elder and senior uh, people with disabilities were, you could report abuse, and that investigation would follow up to make certain that we were keeping them safe, both in their home as well as in the various institutions. Uh, that was a huge uh, undertaking, as you know. Mm -hmm. But in addition, I do budgets, and so it's making certain that those programs that fund uh, senior people with disabilities are funded. Oh, well, thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What did you do to protect current funding for OPI if re-elected, and how would you ensure continued funding for this cost-effective program? Judy, as you know, Oregon has been, I think, probably still one of the only states that have done this, and that is where they use the general fund, fund yes. project independence. And you are correct that every session, it appears as though those who don't fully understand the, uh, the impact of, of the budget that we've done, uh, those of us who have been around for a long time, and appreciate the fact that Oregon actually invested in a complete system. That's on the one hand, project independence, which keeps individuals in their own home, and allow them to be there by doing things like maybe it's a, a, a wheelchair ramp that's needed, or maybe there's some other things that are needed, or maybe there is somebody coming to, to, to take care of them uh, on a periodic basis. But that that program actually pays for itself. And I will continue to advocate for the funding for that program. You know, we, you're right, every session we go through it as one of the first to get on the cutting block. Mm -hmm. And I'm one that says that should probably be one of the last that gets on the cutting block. Well, I thank you. Please give us a two-minute overview of what you did in the past legislative sessions to enhance services for senior and people with disabilities. Oh gosh, and I just said, you know, I, I opened by saying my involvement, everything from Project Independence. I also, uh, through my career, uh, made certain that we had the funding for assisted living facilities mm -hmm. uh, back in, I believe it was 2003, uh, where there was the attempt then to actually not only cut the program, but actually to stop funding for new development of assisted living facilities. And so I happened to be chair that year uh, of uh, the budget and actually refused to do that and uh, said that we, we need it instead of retracting, we probably would need more because as the population we're growing, we're not diminishing. Uh, so for me that was one that I did and of course the other one was my work uh, with Gilliam uh, on the uh, the work group mm -hmm. uh, on the abuse issue to make certain that we were making certain that senior and people with disabilities were being, uh, th that that abuse was being reported. Uh, and that the district attorneys actually would be would follow up and actually investigate, particularly the issue of financial abuse, uh, which I understand has become one of the bigger issues that are involved with seniors. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, thank you. What would you do on a state level 
so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing. Well, a couple things, and I, I was speaking with my neighbor. Uh, one, I think we need to continue to invest, and in, in more so in on the front end, which of course, as you know, that's project independent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and two, I think on afford on the affordable housing issue, it's an issue that. And I was speaking with someone yesterday, day before yesterday. The lands inventory is one that we don't talk about a lot, but yet if I talk to cities and counties, uh, that issue uh, uh, is front and center, and that is that issue of that that we need to they need to make certain that they can actually expand their urban growth boundaries. Mm -hmm because you cannot talk about the issue of affordability without getting into the issue of land. That's one issue. The other uh, issue, and I was speaking with someone the other day, and we talked about the concept of, of tiny houses uh, with 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 inside of that land of having wraparound services so it would not only benefit seniors but it would also benefit homeless and the mentally ill because if you begin to think about both all these entities need certain services with which to function mm -hmm. and so we were t we were talking about i guess utah actually uh is one state that actually is beginning to do that so I said, I guess I'm going to have to go to Utah to visit to see what they're doing uh, on this whole issue of affordable housing uh, with these various population groups. Mm -hmm. I hope to hear more about that later. How would you prioritize state funding, including the fund that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? How would I pro prioritize? Well, actually, I'll start with Project Independence. You know, we never mm -hmm. did get any federal funds for Project Independence, and I think that I still would like to talk to Congress because I think that's an investment that they should make. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would give us a three-to-one leverage that we don't currently have. Uh, the other thing that, as you know, in looking at federal funds, the, our biggest one, of course, is the Medicaid dollars that we do on, uh, on that one. I will probably be again on that work group. I was on the gr last work group, and I'm being briefed, of course, by the Oregon Health Authority. Because as you know, the biggest one of the biggest issues facing uh, us is health care. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so for me, that is a priority uh, uh, of making certain that we're getting those dollars that we need in order to, to make certain that we're giving, uh, we're able to provide the health care, uh, but, but also to encourage Congress to continue uh, that funding and two, to encourage our delegation and Congress to actually make an investment with using those fundings funds for project independence. I think that across the state, across the country, we've lost a huge ability to uh, actually leverage dollars that I think are well worth every penny that we invest in Oregon. Well, thank you. Thank you, Senator Winters. Well, you're welcome. This is Senator Winters, incumbent Republican candidate for Senate District 10. And thank you for joining us today. Can I say thank you, Judy, for inviting me today? Yes. As another senior. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and I thank you as a senior. <laughs>
incumbent who voted against establishing the Oregon Saves program. I would stand for programs that help people save for retirement, find safe housing that's affordable, and secure meaningful living wage work at any age if they would like to be employed in the community. Um, of course, a huge part of financial security is not worrying about the cost of health care, which brings me right back to my most important issue in this campaign. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? Well, as you mentioned, Oregon Project Independence is a great program, and the incumbent against whom I'm running was instrumental in launching it. I give her kudos for that. Um, but I believe that we must also fund it, as you said. It's a very cost-effective program, and I think that large corporations should pay, pay their fair share in supporting our communities from early childhood education through helping seniors. Um, so I support a sector-based gross receipts tax bill which would require large corporations with more than two million dollars in gross receipts to pay a portion of those receipts um, based on their industry sector toward the general fund from which funding for the Oregon Project of Independence could be taken. Um, because this bill would be sector-based, large agricultural entities, for example, would pay a different corporate tax rate than service industry or manufacturing or health care, but smaller family businesses would see their tax rate reduced to a flat annual fee, which is proposed to be less than what most small family businesses already pay. That would help pay for this program, which is so important. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Yeah, as I mentioned in my answer to the very first question, financial security is a major issue for seniors and people with disabilities, and health care and access to housing are two of the largest financial stressors. Um, I will work to seek additional federal funding for affordable housing, and I will work with city and county level leaders, as well as other state leaders, to identify opportunities to develop more affordable housing options here. I'm also supportive of legislation that's fair to both renters and landlords related to rent increase and lease terms, people on fixed incomes are at growing risk of losing their homes and we must find creative ways to develop more housing for seniors and people with disabilities. Thank you. How would you pr prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, for services to an ex increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Yeah. Um, well, I'd, I would prioritize state funding for seniors and people with disabilities this way. First, I would uh, invest in affordable, accessible ser senior housing and housing for people with disabilities um, in partnership with HUD, uh, such as the Retirement Research Foundation does in their programs across the country. Um, we need to, there's no programs with the Retirement Research Foundation here. I think we could start some. I think that would be awesome. Secondly, I believe we need to invest, as I said earlier, in Oregon Project Independence to help help people live in their homes and save thousands of dollars in state funding. Um, then finally, I think we need to invest in uh, congregate and home-based meal programs. We already do that a great deal, but we know that the dollars that we put into helping people stay healthy through having enough food to eat helps save health care costs later. Um, food insecurity um, accounts cost people about 25 percent more in health care per year um, than, if, than if they're able to have enough food to eat. So it's a great Great investment. Yes, it is. Thank you. How will you? Ex how will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? Well, I've spent the last 25 years um, primarily working with seniors and people with disabilities. I've been, as I mentioned, the executive director of an international health organization and the mom of a special needs daughter. Um, and so I've also been on the board of one of the largest providers for uh, community-based health and human service re um, services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the Midwest. And I'm serving on the Nursing and Home Administrators Board and the um, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Advisory Board. So um, 
in our Menwhite Church, where I'm a congregational minister, we have a memory cafe for several dozen community members. We do all kinds of outreach um, for seniors, um, have visiting programs, health committees. Um, this has been my life, <laughs> literally, at home, at work, professionally for 20 years, and I plan to continue this deep and personal commitment to seniors and people with disabilities. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, thank you. And this is Deb P Patterson, Democratic candidate for Senate and District 10. Hi, I'm Cheryl Statz, and I'd like to introduce Senate President Peter Courtney, incumbent Democrat candidate for Senate District 11. Tell us what you did for senior and people with disabilities during your time in office. Well, I've been in office for a while, Cheryl, so I, I, I let me just start with a philosophy. I am a senior. I'm 75, so I may be a senior in this room with all the cameras and everybody's here. So uh, I guess it's, it's, a, it's an attitude I've always had that the, uh, the, the first uh, seniors have basically, they are the ones that have raised the generations. They are the ones that have worked hard all their lives. They are the ones that have helped bring the community to where it is today. And they deserve dignity and respect, whether it's keeping them in their homes, being able to stay, live with relatives, or in a retirement center, whether it's being able to move about freely, anything and everything, I've tried to support programs that deal with their life and their quality of life so that they can feel that they've got dignity and respect. So it's an attitudinal thing, and I think that's budget or policy issues, I've been in the forefront. Thank you. Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to re-elect you. Last session in February, we worked hard to pass a bill to reform our transit system so we could have better bus service, in part to help seniors get around. We continue to make sure we protect project independence. But there's also issues about seniors who want to be able to live in certain places now that they struggle with relatives, friends, whatever. So that is something I think we need a whole lot more work to do. I also think that I want to make sure in health care they don't have to be in long lines, they don't have to do a lot of paperwork. I've seen that, I'm starting to have experience it myself. And so all those little things can make all the difference in the world in a senior's life. And that is something I, I try to remind myself of every time when I'm dealing with senior issues in the Oregon legislature. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What did you do to protect current funding for OPI, and if re-elected, how will you ensure continued funding for this cost-effective program? When you say cut, I don't know. We, we haven't every year done the increasing, so perhaps that's why you're saying cut. And I'd like to think if we can get the funding through K through 12, I want permanent funding, uh, then the general fund money in general will allow us to move in many bold directions. And one of them is in project independence. There is not enough money in it. it I totally agree with that. But every legislator I've ever served with, that is something they feel they like project independence, they support project independence. And that is the one area of the budget that always bothers them at the end, that we haven't been able to do all we want to do. So it's a very legitimate question, and it brings up a, uh, it reminds me, we've got to continually do more to make sure that senior can have dignity and respect in their own homes. Very good, thank you. Please give us a two minute overview of what you did in past legislative sessions to enhance services for seniors and people with disabilities. You said last legislative sessions or session? Sessions. Oh, well, the, the whole area of senior abuse. Uh, we, we, the child abuse thing is always in the forefront. But the senior abuse thing is something that we've had to tr deal with, that there is senior abuse out there. Often it's done in ways that really is tragic by friends and family. So we've worked hard, I think, to pass bills in the session. I've been in very much in the forefront of that. Project Independence, I've already talked about that. This bus thing I worked hard on, I cannot emphasize that enough. The Salem bus system Salem, is inadequate. 
and it's inadequate in many ways. And one of the ways it's inadequate, because seniors have called in, they're by themselves, they can't get to a doctor's appointment, they can't get to church, they can't get to a little shopping mall right down the street. And if we had a more dynamic bus system, so we've changed the structure, and hopefully by changing the structure and the way to fund it, we will boldly allow ourselves to have a much more dynamic bus system in Salem, Kaiser, and therefore seniors, they won't have to live in fear of not being able to get around, which I've learned is one of the great fears. So whether it's how they live in their homes, you know, whether it's how they're treated, abuse, or whether it's how they get around, mm -hmm. get around, I think I've worked very, very hard with specific legislation, budgets, as well as an attitude. It's not just because I'm a senior, I was raised by my grandmother because my mother had Parkinson's disease, and I always, uh, I miss her terribly. She always, uh, I always was reminded by her how great she was as a human being. She'd already raised her own family, and she came back to help myself and my brothers be raised. So it's a, it's a reminder of how precious she was in my life, but how important seniors are to our society. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Oh, uh, this is a big one. You, you got into housing because housing's a crisis. Uh, I'm working with the Salem Y to build 40 units of available housing. Uh, we've talked about veterans, but you know what I'm saying? Downtown housing would really be great if you can have some senior housing down there so they can walk, get around, now because transportation can be an issue. Uh, we have to remind ourselves every day now we don't have affordable ex and accessible housing. And part of that is its location, and part of it's uh, being able to get into it and out of it easily, and part of it is also being able to afford it, because many seniors live on a very limited income. So we've got to remind ourselves, we talk about housing, it's not just for the young people who are struggling, or veterans, some of the veterans that are you know, wounded and hurting. We got the seniors to think about too. So it's, every session we are talking more and more about housing and, and seniors have to be a part of that discussion. Thank you. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? The word prioritization always bothers me because I always think if you prioritize one, you have to take away from another. And I also think if you're really a great civilization, you find a way to take care of, you know, I've often said you judge a society about how it treats its very young and its elderly. And I really believe, I think that defines a civilization more than anything else. So I prioritize young, the young people, the children, and I prioritize seniors. Now, that isn't exclusive because you've got people that aren't in either category, but they're suffering from day to day, they struggle from day to day. So uh, I think you just have to have an attitude. If we're gonna call ourselves a great civilization, a great society, we better be taking care of the children and we better be taking care of our seniors and those that are less fortunate, struggle every day to get by. Thank you. This is Senate President Peter Courtney, who is the incumbent Democrat candidate for Senate District 11. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Senator Kim Thatcher, Republican candidate for Senate District 13. Welcome. Thank you. I have a few questions for you today. Uh, tell us what you did for seniors and people with disabilities during your time in office. Well, one of the more recent things I did, and I don't recommend this, I earned some empathy for people with disabilities mm. and uh, seniors. I, I had a really bad accident a couple years ago. I'm mm -hmm. still recovering mm -hmm. from it. And I was in a skilled nursing facility, nursing home. And I saw, kind of got a front row view to what happens with uh, people who are consigned to those for a long period of time. Um, it's one way to feel young. I mean, I was the youngest one there, but there were, there were situations where I could see that th wonderful people helping these seniors and people with disability. But there were some, I would say, were in the wrong profession. And they really needed to have a little bit more empathy, uh, treat others as, they would treat themselves or would want their, their own loved ones treated. 
and I could see that there's such a difference between being able to stay at home and get care, because I had that too afterwards, and having to be in a facility where you're separated from everybody, and, and you really don't have that same ability to to advocate for yourself, either you know being on heavy medication <laughs> or um, you know not being in one's own mind, where uh, my roommate who was calling for uh, help quite often during the middle of the night seemed to be, her calls for help seemed to be ignored. Now, I don't know the rest of the story, why they were deciding that she was just maybe a, a nuisance to them or something, but I, I felt that having that personalized in-home care with like Oregon Project Independence is so much more preferable and mm -hmm. definitely uh, something that I even feel more strongly about than ever. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that insight. Please tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or a people with disabilities to re-elect you. Well, one of the things I've observed from family members is that pocketbook issues are sacrosanct. You're on a limited income. Uh, the reason we've, we had uh, property tax measures go into place, you know, it's in our Constitution Measure 5 you hear referred to, um, is because people were getting taxed out of their homes. We do have a program, it, though it was suspended for a short period of time, called uh, the Property Tax Deferral. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for that, I know my grandmother would have lost her house. And I think this affects women, elderly women, more often, simply because they live longer and generally speaking, and also because they don't have as much built up for retirement, for pension, because of how the system works. Mm -hmm. And so when the, her home was has been paid for for 20, 30 years, and, and then the property taxes keep creeping up, even with the property tax limitation, they, they keep going up. If it wasn't for the uh, her ability to defer her taxes, her property taxes, I know she would have lost her home. And um, I also support Measure 103 that's on the ballot. It's a constitutional amendment that would uh, restrict or prohibit sales taxes on groceries. Necessities like groceries should not ever be subject to sales tax. And, and I know that there's a push to get uh, sales taxes into Oregon. <laughs> there have been a nine attempts, so we'll see how the tenth attempt goes. But I also would like to look into homeowners associations, especially when they're dealing with people who have ability, uh, disabilities or, um, or they're seniors. There was a situation up in uh, King City where uh, there was a you know, there's a dispute, and she ended up having to use a bucket for her bathroom, um, and having to take that out and trying trying to resolve that is something I think we need to we need to look into. Mm, yes, Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with mm -hmm. disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What did you do to protect current funding for OPI and if elect re-elected, how would you ensure uh, continued funding for this cost-effective program? Time and time again, I've had advocates come and visit my office and it, the program makes so much more sense than having to send people to a, a nursing home for uh, so much more money. It's just it's not cost effective at all. So I am definitely for cost effective programs, especially in our government. And there was a bill introduced in 2017. It was Senate Bill 462. And I don't even think it got a hearing, but it would have given a tax credit for those who donated to Oregon Project Independence. And I think that would have been helpful. It would have helped a, a little bit, get a little bit more investment in the program. Um, and also, Having two family members go through, somewhat recently, um, a contrast of situations. One ended up in a nursing home. The other relative ended up being able to utilize Project Independence and seeing the, the quality of life contrasted between the two. It's just night and day, mm. night and day. And keeping Project Independence and keeping uh, people in their homes for as long as they can is just the only way to go besides the cost effectiveness mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities lo no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? You know, it's funny. 
we there's a push by cities to get rid of the property tax limitation and I think a lot of people are forgetting the reasons one of the big reasons those property tax limitations were put in place it was because people were losing their homes people who had already paid for their homes and were facing these horrendous tax bills every month while on a limited income that's not doable not sustainable and so I would be opposed to further property tax increases and I would like to be able to help uh, seniors be able to take advantage more seniors be able to take advantage of the tax deferral program um, also when you know we have high costs of licensing regulation before shovels even put in the ground to build a home there's all kinds of costs that are lumped on top our urban growth growth boundary line um, is presents a problem our land use system uh, that needs to be looked at we we have a very complicated and expensive way of, of building homes mm -hmm. that we've put in place in Oregon and it makes it less affordable to live mm -hmm. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, there are a number of things that I wish we would do better at the state of Oregon. And focusing funding on those programs that most efficiently m meet the missions that the, state, the people of the state of Oregon have given us and taking care of our elderly and people with disabilities, that's a social contract mm -hmm. that we have. And we should be doing it the most efficient way and most beneficial way, and Project Independence comes together and does both of those things. Uh, one of the things that we, we faced during the recession was that we had to do across the board cuts because that's what's in the statute, and that doesn't make any sense when, when, when we have to make across the board cuts at a certain percentage for each agency you're not prioritizing and so we need to prioritize cuts <laughs> when we're faced in that situation we have to prioritize our spending and we need to uh, perhaps not every year do zero based budgeting where we take an agency periodically strip it down to zero and rebuild it make sure that we are prioritizing and meeting the mission of the agency and best mm -hmm. in accomplishing that. Yep. Uh, interesting, okay. Thank you for your insight today. This is Senator Kim Thatcher, Republican candidate for Senate District 13. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, I'm Judy Richards and I would like to welcome Sarah Greider Democratic nominee for Senate District 13. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. You know, I would like you to tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or a person with a disability to vote for you. Well, given that I work in um, a special education at Newburgh High School and that I've cared for elderly um, folks in a home, senior foster home, um, I have a sort of unique experience that I've, I've been touched by these communities particularly and work with them. Um, my three positions that I think folks could um, understand and get behind would be, one, I think our culture needs to change. Um, we definitely put some of these most um, needy communities last in our funding, in our policy, um, in our infrastructure. So we need to change our culture. Second, we have to look at how we're writing policy and make sure that these folks are integrated in accessible ways in our policy. And third, we have to look at how we're building our infrastructure and communities to make them more accessible. Oregon Project Independence is a program that kept seniors and people with disabilities in their homes. And yet every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What would you do, or what will you do, to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? 
In Oregon, we definitely need to look at um, corporate tax reform. Um, there's um, sustainable funding streams there that we can use to help fix some of our biggest gaps in funding for some of our most essential programs. So definitely looking at corporations in Oregon paying their fair share. We've gone from an 18% corporate tax to just a third of that, 6%. And, and our schools funding to help folks with disabilities and our elderly are losing out and it's just not fair. We have to prioritize those communities. Thank you. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Um, as I talked about before, changing the culture will definitely change how we prioritize these communities. And looking at beforehand and being proactive in writing policy that integrates and makes accessibility choices for everyone, sustainable funding streams, and also looking at being more open to things like accessibility or um, accessory dwelling units, mm -hmm. the small houses, things like that, and breaking down barriers so that families have more options. Okay. How would you prioritize the state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disability population? Well, you know, I think that I take a very proactive and um, efficient approach to things. So I think that engineering and systems that support these communities before the policies are written, before buildings are created, um, looking at building the infrastructure in in the beginning, um, again, funding streams, making sure that we're proactive and making sure that these communities are built in and that we're intersectional and addressing different communities' needs before things are put into place rather than reactive and having to re-engineer things and go back and change mm -hmm. um, is the way that I would approach that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? My work with um, either in education or working with the elderly has been transformational. Um, I definitely have experienced firsthand how so many of these marginalized communities are put last in our state and in our country, in our communities, and it's just an absolute shame. Um, and I think that um, how I will work to um, how I will work to address the needs of those communities is as I do the work in my classroom and as I do the work with the elderly in the care home that I um, work part-time at is, is putting them first and treating them like a member of my family and making sure that they're not left behind. I see. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you. This is Sarah Greider, and she is the Democratic nominee for State District 13. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. The mission of Northwest Senior and Disability Services is to promote dignity, independence, and health, honor choice, and empower people. Long-term services and supports is a range of services for people with chronic illness, physical disabilities, or cognitive disabilities. Northwest Senior and Disability Services has information about the long-term services and supports available in your community. Northwest Senior and Disability Services is an area agency on aging that serves both seniors and people with disabilities. An area agency on aging is a public or private nonprofit agency designated by the state to address the needs of older Americans at the local level. We have volunteer advisory council openings on the Senior Advisory and the Disability Services Advisory Council. Call 503-304-3451 for an application. Information about Northwest Senior and Disability Services can be found on the agency's website, www nwsds.org. Hello, I'm John Newman, and I'd like to welcome Renee Windsor White, Democratic nominee for House District 17. Thank welcome. you, John. Good to be here today. Thank you. 
tell us at least three of your physicians that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Okay. Number one, um, I want to protect seniors, uh, veterans, and persons with disabilities from any cuts in, in federal aid. I would increase state funding to match, try to um, match any cuts in federal funding. Number two, I want to increase um, the possibility of health care for everyone in the state of Oregon for comprehensive and affordable health care. And I know that's an additional, um, can be an additional um, burden on folks with disabilities and seniors. And number three, I want to increase mental health coverage um, for those in the state of Oregon. So those are the three issues that I'm focusing on right now. Okay. Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost effective program? Number one, I would sponsor any bills that would help to stop the cutting in funding. I would also um, vote in favor of bills that were, would be sponsored from either side of the aisle to make sure that that program is, continues to be funded. That is such a valuable program because it cuts down on the cost of keeping people in their own homes and the benefit to seniors and persons with disabilities in staying in their own homes is um, so valuable that I believe that program could, should be continued and funding should be increased in order to keep seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes. Okay. How would you prioritize funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities? population. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Good job, you made it through. Yeah. Um, I would make sure what we're facing now or what we could be facing in the future is increasing cuts from the federal government. I would work um, in any way possible to make sure that state funding would take care of that gap. Um, I know that States often say, we don't have the funds, we have to take it from someplace else. It's the famous robbing Peter to pay Paul. Other people, other programs feel like they're going to bear the brunt of increased funding to seniors and disabled, but I think that is our frailest population and they must be served and they must be taken care of by our state. Okay. How will your experience shape the work you do on behalf of senior and people with disabilities? Thanks. I have been married for 15 years. My husband was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's when we had been married for three years. He is um, currently in a long-term care facility up in Portland, and even though I live in Lebanon, um, he had to be, um, he is cared for up there. My experience with getting him into long-term care and having the experience of living with someone uh, with Alzheimer's, I think, puts me at an advantage in terms of helping seniors and those with disabilities make sure that they get all the services that they need. I am empathetic. I am totally in sympathy and in empathy with folks who are undergoing that situation, both the um, person with a disability or with Alzheimer's and the family. It's such a struggle to go through it at all. So I want to make sure that they have every form of support that they need. Thank you. We've been talking to you, Renee. Mm -hmm. Windsor White. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. You bet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Crandall, and I'd like to welcome Representative Rick Lewis, Republican candidate for House District 18. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Tell us what you did for seniors and people with disabilities during your time in office. Um, I actually, I was a mayor in Silverton until uh, 2017 when our former representative had to uh, resign for health reasons. And so um, I was appointed in February of 2017, so I actually came into the 
first session late and uh, I was appointed to the Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee. So I didn't have an opportunity to do any bills in the first session uh, related to senior and disability services, but um, on the Veterans Committee I had opportunities to work on, uh, on some bills related to veterans who are senior citizens and also uh, to disabled veterans. And so we put forth a lot of bills under the uh, uh, ballot measure 96 lottery funding about 18 million dollars it was a bipartisan committee so we were able to do quite a bit in that um, in the last two sessions in fact to uh, to do some things for veterans around mental health around homelessness around uh, uh, general medical benefits and things like that so that was uh, the experience I had in the first two sessions thank you tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to reelect you. Okay, the um, uh, probably the most important one is uh, bilateral hearing aids. And uh, under Medicaid, under the Medicaid program at the federal level, they leave it up to the states um, how to regulate uh, how they're going to provide hearing aids to uh, to uh, people that are el Med Medicaid eligible. And so I have a bill in the next session already that's going to allow for two hearing aids instead of the current provision that only allows for one. That's going to be really important for senior and disabled citizens. And also um, the work that we did on the, um, on, on the in the Veterans Committee, um, that is going to continue. I'm a very strong supporter of doing whatever we can for veterans, particularly those that are senior citizens and disabled, and we have quite a few in this state. And then the other thing I think is probably around homelessness and, and affordable housing. And uh, I'll be working in the next session to try to come up with some ways to, to uh, expand and improve in that area as well. So those, those are my priorities going into the next session. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What did you do to protect current funding for OPI? And if reelected, how will you ensure continued funding for this cost-effective program? OPI is a very, very effective and efficient program. And it keeps people in their homes uh, much longer than they otherwise could stay. It provides in-home services uh, for those people so they can stay there and enjoy an active life. Um, People tend to do better, I think, when they're in their homes instead of being put in a facility somewhere or in an assisted living facility if they can be around friends and family and continue their lifestyle. Uh, the governor's recommended budget, she has to do that, the governor has to do that at the start of every legislative session, uh, the biennium, I should say. And so she cut that back from $27 million to five million, which was the absolute minimum that the federal government would allow to continue to provide federal funding. We were able as a legislature to restore that back to 27.1 in the last session. It'll be my priority to make sure we keep that funding there. It's a very important program. I'm so glad to hear that. What would you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? I think in the next session, and probably the next two sessions, affordable housing is going to be right at the top of the list of priorities. Um, we talk about it all the time. I think that uh, I, have, I have a couple of, of ideas. Uh, one idea is to incentivize cities and developers uh, so that they can build housing at a less expensive cost, and then cities would still get their system development charges, get reimbursed by the state for that so that we can do more around affordable housing for seniors in particular. My interest is in affordable housing, but it's in mostly in affordable housing for seniors and disabled. And I worked on some of that when I was the mayor in Silverton. We didn't get very far before I went to the legislature. But I think it's gonna be important, it's gonna be a priority for me to make sure that we can, we can do something to help in that regard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? The, uh, the unfortunate thing about the, the state right now is that we, we've seen a, 
pretty significant increase in revenue in, in this current biennium, but we have some things that are causing us some angst. One of those is PERS, and the other one is the, the uh, deficit that we're going to be facing going into the next biennium on health care. And so I think we need, to, we need to quit kicking that PERS can down the road. We've got to fix it. And then as far as my personal priorities, I, I voted for the transportation bill in the last session primarily because it provides additional millions of dollars in additional funding for busing and to get people that are in those rural areas of uh, the state to, the access, to be able to access the services they need if they don't drive. I'll be working on that and uh, I'll, I'll keep affordable housing as a priority. I'll keep uh, the project of independence as a priority. And I think amongst those three things, I think we can accomplish a lot. I agree. Thank you so much for being here and for your insight. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. This is Representative Rick Lewis, Republican candidate for House District 18. Hello, I'm Colin Brown. I'd like to welcome Mr. Barry Shapiro, Democratic candidate for House 18. Welcome. Thank you, Colin. First question that we're going to ask you today. Could you tell us at least three of your positions that might encourage a person who is elderly or a person with disabilities to think of you as a candidate and vote for you? Sure. Um, the first would be to promote financial assistance for families caring for an aging parent, the proposed Americans Giving Care to Elders or AGE Act, and credit for Social Security benefits for people who leave the workforce to care for aging family members, the proposed Social Security Caregiver Act. Medicare coverage for hearing aids. This seems like an odd and out of the out of the blue, but a lot of seniors have hearing problems. Hearing aids are very expensive and they're not covered. Um, I also want to ensure effective programming that would be available and accessible to everyone and anyone with disabilities. For something like stuttering, for example, I was a severe stutterer until the time I was 23 when I went through a behavior modification based program in Virginia. It was a three week intensive program. When I arrived, they diagnosed me as 66% disfluent, which meant two thirds of the time you couldn't understand what I was trying to say. The day I left, they diagnosed me as 99% fluent. This is a program that has proven itself year after year as incredibly effective. They run an average success rate of about 93% and they need private funding to continue. There are over three million stutterers in the country. They all need access to effective and accessible health care and therapy. Thank you very much. Our second question, there is Oregon Project Independence, a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in the safety and their familiarity of their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What can you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? <clears throat> Not being a politician, it is very difficult for me to understand why our government chooses to defund programs that need funding the most. Particularly programs that can provide needed benefits while saving taxpayer dollars. The mission of OPI is to provide preventative in-home services, reducing in-home, in-hospital and other costly facility expenses. OPI was meant to provide such important services as helping ser seniors and the disabled with dressing, bathing, going to the bathroom, and making meals as well as shopping and transportation. Considered a needs-based program, OPI simply cannot fulfill its intended mission with half the funding. Or less, 20 hours a month for seniors and nothing for those with disabilities is totally inadequate. DHS needs to properly fund 
OPI and other programs that benefit seniors and the disabled. It is their responsibility and the state's obligation. Thank you very much. Question three. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Mm. The challenge of making affordable housing in the state is not limited to our seniors and people with disabilities, nor is it limited to Portland. By putting off a comprehensive plan, we are only making the situation harder to solve. People are living longer. The senior population is increasing. By 2035, one in three households will be headed by someone who is older than 65. The 80 plus population will double. The national average for private assisted living is approximately $4,000 a month. Out of reach for most seniors who barely make a month, who barely make enough for basic expenses. Most experts agree public, house, public housing is not the answer. We need to ensure existing programs are working. HUD's limit for individuals in Marion County qualifying as extremely low income is only 14,700 annually. Coverage drops to 50% at 24,450. HUD's 202 housing program needs to be protected and expanded to provide housing for every older adult that needs it. We also need to get creative with ideas like mini retirement villages, cottage communities, and shared living. Thank you very much. Question four. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population. How can you do that? As I mentioned, Colin, I would, I would like to see HUD's 202 program supplemented by state funding. We have to put funding where it will do the most good, shoring up state funding to help families who have taken on the added responsibilities and expenses of caring for an aging or disabled family member. Our state family caregiver program should be one of our top priorities. Telling our old and disabled citizens that we don't have it in the budget is simply unacceptable. If elected, I can represent the Democratic supermajority in the House, which would allow us to close costly loopholes. We need to make sure everyone pays their fair share. And I'm saying the mega corporations and the 1% especially. Thank you. Our last question. And this really relates to your background, your experience. How will your experience as an artist and as a businessman and a teacher shape the work that you will do on behalf of people and uh, seniors and people with disabilities? As I mentioned earlier, I have a personal and direct experience with a disability as a severe stutterer. I understand the humiliation and the frustrations only someone with a handicap experiences. After graduating one of the best art schools in the country, I was told how good my portfolio was, but that I would never get anywhere with that stutter. My personal experience compels me to ensure those deemed disabled are given every opportunity to improve the quality of their lives. Healthcare and assistance when needed and access to effective treatment when appropriate. As for seniors, I have been teaching art for the last 10 years. And just as I understand that our children represent the future, our seniors are the fastest growing segment of the population. It is expected that the percentage of people 65 and older will be more than children for the first time in history. During the course of my campaign, I have encountered many seniors. They take an active role in politics and social issues by demonstrating and volunteering their time to issues and causes they care about. Seniors have a wealth of experience and knowledge that have given many organizations their substance. I know personally, I am who I am because of my grandmother. Well, both of my mother's parents. My grandmother encouraged me and passed on her love of reading and literature. My grandfather passed on his love-hate relationship with the Boston Red Sox, mm. and I have been a fan ever since. Thank you very much, Mr. Shapiro. We much appreciate you being here and sharing your views. 
And uh, thank you to our viewers. Mr. Shapiro is running for House District 18, the old seat that was populated by Vic Gillum, I understand. That's you had correct. to retire to illness. So thank you so much again for coming, and we thank you, our audience, for listening to us today. Thank you, Colin, and thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Denise Bowles, Republican candidate for House District 19. Welcome, Denise. Thanks, Judy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Tell us at least three of your positions on what would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. All right. Well, I have to tell you this. Um, comes really natural to, naturally to me. I've been kind of the advocate in my family for both seniors and my brother has a disability as well and his wife. And so I've grown up um, in a community that looks out for, I think, our most vulnerable. And I think it's seniors, um, people with disabilities, and our children. And so um, I've been an advocate my whole life. So one of the things that you can count on me here is to continue to advocate for the people in my community that need that. Um, things like um, uh, uh, project independence, which I know we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, pocketbook issues as far as um, things that we're voting for in the House that um, would affect uh, people on fixed incomes, and looking at things like with regards to transportation and all that, but making sure that we are doing really positive things with the money that we're given and being careful with that because anytime we add to our budget, lots of times it trickles down and it affects um, our seniors in a disproportionate level. So you can count on me to continue the advocacy of my life into the House, um, into the legislature for the people in my community. Well, thank you for that. Oregon Project Independence is a program that kept mm -hmm. seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. Mm -hmm. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? Oregon Project Independence, I think, is one of the best things we do in this state. Um, I come from an extraordinarily independent group of people. In fact, my grandmother lived in southeast Portland by herself in the house that she raised my mom um, until she was 93 years old. And um, not just because she, uh, just her independent nature, but it allows, I think Oregon Project Independence allows people to keep the dignity, keep their um, ability to make decisions for themselves. And as you get older, it's already frustrating, I imagine, to be dealing with so many other issues and then to have people starting to take those decision-making abilities away from you. So in Oregon, I know we have an issue just because it's all, it's all general fund money and so it becomes part of this um, political badminton that we play at the end of the session. But um, I will be one of your strongest advocates in that building because I have seen the benefit of this personally and as well as the people in my community. Mm. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? You know, that is becoming kind of the, the big conversation as a community here in Oregon about housing and affordability across the spectrum. I believe that seniors and people with disabilities should be prioritized in that conversation. And we also need to make sure that we're building housing that is appropriate for, um, you know, for accessibility. And so all of those things need to be a stronger part of the conversation that we're having here. And um, I would be, you know, again, I'm very common sense and practical about um, everything that I approach. So I bring that kind of perspective in these, in these um, policy decisions as far as, okay, how are we going to get here? Is this apartment, is this appropriate for someone who is in a wheelchair or someone who, um, you know, whether through a disability or through um, age? And uh, we need to be a little bit more forward thinking in that, in that when we're um, building the affordable housing as well as prioritizing people that need it the most. Oh, you're right about that. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disability population? You know, we, in this community, we're having an exponential growth over the next 10 years of um, people moving in here um, that are from other parts of, actually parts of the country because mm -hmm. we have such a, 
uh, such a great place to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know there's a lot of community conversations in order to make sure that we can meet the needs of an aging population. So I think back to kind of at the beginning, the priorities that we have, um, we have a societal responsibility to, um, to our aging and uh, disabilities, and we need to make sure that that is reflective in our policies and in our budgeting process. So it's a battle, but it is one that I think is worth having because, you know, this is the you know this is these are the people that we're kind of coming behind, and there's a responsibility, I think, as both as a family and a, and a community and a government to take care of. So it would be a real high priority for me. Oh, thank you. How will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? You know, I've um, spent a lot of time, my family had an adult foster care home mm. growing up, and so, and, and ironically, both of my parents were only children, so I thought everybody's aunts and uncles were 80 years old, <laughs> and um, that, I really did, that's what I grew up with, and so it is, um, and then my brother has had a, a disability from the time he was about a year and a half old, um, through uh, through some some things and um, so we've constantly been as a family talking about issues you know how do we you know get your independence you know how you know how do we do this so I it's really personal for me I mean I have some professional experience as well working for the hospital and such but personally um, I've walked through a lot of really hard situations and as I mentioned mm. before um, we're a pretty independent crew, and so my first nature is to how can you have as much control and opinion about what's happening that's appropriate to your level mm -hmm. of need. So um, I would just bring a lot of that into this, uh, into my role here at the legislature. I already have, and I will uh, continue to do so. Oh, well, thank you, Denise. Thank you. This is Denise Boyles, Republican candidate for House District 19. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Stephen Manassas. I'm here to welcome Mike Ellison, Democratic candidate for House District Number 19. Thank you for being here today. And thank you for having me. Yeah, this is you're a real welcome. pleasure. You're welcome. Mike, can you tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior person with disabilities to vote for you? Well, generally speaking, uh, you know, the theme of my campaign since the beginning has been uh, restoring uh, the American dream and making that a reality uh, for all Oregonians. Um, I think, and, and a big part of that is, you know, being able to, to retire comfortably or uh, if you have to leave the workforce for any reason, mm -hmm. um, just making sure that uh, you have the security you need. Uh, more specifically, um, I think we have a, a moral responsibility to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, so that includes, you know, holding the people accountable that may seek to take advantage or abuse uh, seniors or our disabled persons. Um, and I'm also, you know, an advocate for increasing our uh, access to affordable housing and uh, uh, access to affordable health care and reducing prescri prescription drug costs. Excellent. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? I think it's, it's past time that Oregon um, does something to uh, generate additional revenue. Uh, you know, we need, to, we need to get out of this cycle of finding places to cut uh, public assistance. Uh, you know, there's programs across, across the board that uh, we have a responsibility to to meet and um, you know there's there's a lot of uh, corporations in the state and you know uh, multinational uh, businesses that are extremely profitable right now that I, I don't feel are paying their fair share mm -hmm. and so um, you know I think uh, coming up with a, a different uh, structure to increase our revenue uh, through that um, avenue is is very important um, so that we can we can fund programs like OPI that are, that are proven to be effective. Mike, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Affordable housing is definitely, uh, we're in crisis mode right now, and I think there's two approaches we need to take. Uh, the first is to increase the uh, stock of available affordable housing uh, throughout the state. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also need to uh, you know, have 
certain tenant protections. Uh, you know, so people with low income or on a fixed income that are facing these extreme rent hikes we're seeing right now, uh, making sure that, that these rent hikes aren't forcing them out of a stable uh, place to live. Um, and then we also need to uh, limit the use of no-cause evictions. Mm -hmm. uh, so through, through uh, increasing our available housing stock and, and protecting tenants, uh, I think we'll go a long way towards keeping seniors and disabled persons in stable housing. Very good, thank you. Yeah. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? As I said a little earlier, I think you know a role of government and a role of elected officials uh, is to protect our most vul vulnerable populations. So when you're prioritizing areas for funding, um, you know people who need the most uh, should see our you know available funding first, and mm -hmm. that would include uh, seniors and disabled persons, uh, making sure that we're taking care of uh, you know our communities. Very good. Thank you. How will you, your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? I've always been someone that um, has just had a d natural desire to be of service to my community, whether it's through uh, volunteering, uh, my time as an electrician, or just uh, you know, in general, uh, whether it's going over and helping a neighbor with an electrical issue, I've always had the desire to be of service um, and, and uh, try to do the best I can to, to help improve some people's lives. Um, and so my experience in that, I think, uh, is a natural fit um, you know, for helping uh, these communities. Well, thank you for your responses. Yeah, thank it's you nice very much. Have, nice to have you here. Yeah, this is a pleasure, thank you. All right, thank you. This is Mike Ellison, Democratic candidate for House District Number 19. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Plowhead, and I'm here with uh, Representative Paul Evans, the incumbent Democrat candidate for House District 20. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. This is Absolutely. great. Absolutely. So we're going to be talking about seniors and people with disabilities mm -hmm. and getting your thoughts on that today. So tell us what you did for seniors and people with disabilities during your time in office. Well, I've been elected uh, to the legislature in uh, 2014 and again in 2016, mm -hmm. so I'm in my uh, second term. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've done everything I can to make sure that the folks living in House District 20 uh, have a strong voice in the Capitol to make sure that their concerns are heard. Mm -hmm. And in that particular instance, it means that making sure that seniors have uh, an opportunity through Project Independence. We've tried to expand access to affordable housing. We have pushed the boundaries and actually recently changed how the Salem-Kaiser Salem Transit Board operates so that actually transportation is going to be a little more easy to get to in the future. Mm -hmm. And overall, uh, we've tried to make sure that the services that are needed for everybody, not just the seniors, but uh, everybody, uh, are dealt with in a way that is both responsible and fair. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to re-elect you. I think there are three things that um, I would tell or ask anybody to consider. Uh, first is the value of service, mm -hmm. the value of leadership, and the value of results. Uh, over the last 30 years, I've been in and out of government as a city councilor, mm -hmm. as a mayor, as a school board member. Uh, I've served two terms as a legislator, and I was a senior policy advisor to Governor Kulongoski. I think that understanding how government functions and what government should and shouldn't do mm -hmm. matters. I think leadership matters. I led the fight to make sure the ballot measure 96 got to the ballot and that veterans got a 1.5% set aside of the lotteries, which have unlocked millions of dollars in terms of leveraging federal funds. So I know how to actually navigate the process. I know how to get things done. The third thing is results. I've stood up for seniors, mm -hmm. especially at times when it wasn't necessarily easy to do so. Mm -hmm. In Oregon, uh, anytime you support a tax, especially mm -hmm. if you're in a swing district, mm -hmm. uh, that sometimes comes with a penalty. But I stood up to make sure that the hospital provider tax, which helped make sure that people had more access mm -hmm. to health care, uh, passed, and I'll continue to do the same. So I believe that at the end of the day, service, leadership, and results are the most important factors that make me the best choice. Okay. Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in yes, their own homes and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is set cut significantly. Mm -hmm. What did you do to protect current funding for OPI 
And if re-elected, how would you ensure continued funding for this cost-effective program? Well, to begin with, no person running for office should ever say that they guarantee uh, how things will be decided in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. That said, I'll continue to do what I've done before. Uh, inside the caucus as a Democrat, but a conservative Democrat, mm -hmm. I've had a role in terms of making sure that we don't forget the fundamental value of ensuring that seniors can have an option. Mm -hmm. In rural Oregon, which I represent a, a district that includes some rural and some urban, mm -hmm. it is especially important to recognize that making sure people can be independent in their homes is not just good policy, but in many ways it's actually the most efficient use of public resources. Mm -hmm. So in the next term, uh, I plan on doing everything I can to ensure that that finer point isn't missed in the conversation. Thank you. Give us a two-minute overview of what you did in past legislative sessions to enhance services for seniors and people with disabilities. Okay. Well, over the last two terms, uh, several issues uh, we've tried to tackle, and I think they've had an impact. Number one was raising the document recording fee. Not a very sexy subject, but mm -hmm. something that actually has made a fundamental difference. We've raised it from $20 to $60 and that is set aside for housing construction and grants to make sure that housing is more affordable and available. We've also made sure that uh, for folks in aging homes uh, that there's a new license requirement to ensure that people actually have a safer environment. Mm -hmm. We've worked very hard to try and curb elder abuse across the board. And as a legislator, uh, I have pushed very hard to make sure that veteran services are fully funded. And what veteran services do not just taking care of the veteran families, mm -hmm. but basically freeing up state capacity that can be used for seniors that aren't veterans. Mm -hmm. So I believe over the last two terms I've actually made uh, a good impact. I'm not sure but it's a big impact, but I've made a good impact. And I believe over the next two years I can make an even bigger and more important one. Okay, thank you. What would you, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Well, I go back to uh, housing is really a two-step problem. The first is we don't have enough inventory. Mm -hmm. And the second is, in our attempts to try and make uh, costs more equitable, more fair, we have a very haphazard approach. So to be very clear, uh, I believe it's time to have um, a statewide uh, declaration of emergency when it comes to housing. I actually have asked the governor to do so. Mm -hmm. It may be part symbolic, but it also allows some sharing of resources that aren't always done during normal times. What that would mean is that we would have the ability to put forward housing for emergency and temporary housing, mm -hmm. and we would have more flexibility in terms of some of the rules and procedures about siting of homes, again, inside the urban growth boundary. I'm not talking about changing land use planning, but inside the urban growth boundary there are some uh, rules that might need a little bit of adjusting for local concerns. So what I'd like to do is build upon the work we've done, make sure the document recording fee hit that has set aside 30 to 40 million more dollars for mm -hmm. support, and looking at regulations and uh, trying to help home builders get in the business of finding incentives to build the kind of housing we need instead of the kind of housing we've been building for the last four or five years that is high on profit, but not so great on actually meeting our needs. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Uh, well, I, I, I would continue to try to prioritize that in, in tier one. Um, every dollar we can draw down from the federal government uh, is a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to retrain uh, new legislators and educate some legislators that have been there a while mm -hmm about the value of helping people from New York and New Jersey and Texas help us with our priorities. Mm -hmm. Oregon is one of those states that often is giving more money to the federal government than the federal government is coming back to us in terms of our dollars. So we have to be smart about finding new ways to leverage resources, to identify gaps, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're allowing as much federal dollar to be invested in the state of Oregon as possible. I think that we've made real progress in terms of veterans policies. There's some models there that I'd like to move over to senior care, senior transportation specifically, mm -hmm. and I look forward to that opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This has been yeah. fun. Well, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we've been with uh, Representative Paul Evans, who is the incumbent Democrat candidate for House District 20. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Plowhead, and I'm here with Selma Pierce, the Republican nominee for House District 20. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. Tell me at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Well, I respect seniors quite a bit, okay? Um, we all have parents and grandparents that are seniors. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of wisdom, yeah. and I really appreciate how much they do encourage us. Mm -hmm. um, people with uh, disabilities, I do feel that we can let them contribute if we let them do so. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it's also very important that they are also allowed to work and I would feel that tax credits to employers would be very helpful to encourage that. If seniors are still interested in working then they should and able to do so they should be encouraged to do so either maybe through part-time work or job sharing. Okay. All right. So Oregon Project Independence is a program that has kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure to protect funding for this cost-effective program? I think it's a program that's worth funding. Mm -hmm. um, most people that I know that are older or have disabilities prefer to stay in their own homes. They even say, I want to be home. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important because when they're home, they feel more comfortable, they can do more for themselves, mm -hmm. they are also happier, and it, um, it also makes it so that they are as fully living as they can be. So I think it's a project very well worth fully funding. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of affordable and accessible housing? We need to have more housing that is more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at what causes housing to be affordable, we have um, uh, the cost of land, mm -hmm. um, system development fees, mm -hmm. we also have um, the cost of the building, mm -hmm. and also um, how do we um, uh, look at th these items so that they are, you know, there's, there are some design elements that are add to the cost. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to look at all of those categories mm -hmm. to see what we can do to mitigate the cost of housing because there just is not enough money to subsidize expensive housing. Okay. Okay. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding? that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population. I think this is very important and if there are funds, federal funds that are available mm -hmm. out there that can be matched with state funds then we should find those state funds to match because when state funds are matched we have more funds, we can have more resources, we can help more people mm -hmm. and when we can help more people then um, they will be healthier, happier and they will, then we can uh, help people be hap as best as they can be. Okay. All right, thank you. How would your experience shape the work you do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? I actually have a 91-year-old mother who needs a lot of assistance with her daily living. She lives near my brother, he helps mm -hmm. her. My 90-year-old mother-in-law lives near me, mm -hmm. so I have the opportunity of helping her, and I've been helping her for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I also have a friend who has a son that was has become disabled and the whole family is interacting with him and helping him so that he can be at home. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a very hard and difficult role to help people. And so if we can also have a little help, maybe a little respite now and then, or even a little assistance, this makes our job so much easier to help our uh, neighbors, or our relatives. And when we can do that, I think everyone's happier because everyone is home and they're surrounded by love versus being in an institution. Plus, it's a lot cheaper to do that. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank you for being here with us. This is Selma Pierce, the Republican candidate for House District 20. Hello, I'm Colin Brown, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Jack L. Esp, Republican nominee for House District 21. Correct. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to ask our first question, which is, please could you tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you? Well, probably the first one is my age. I am a senior. I am in good health, thank God, and 
I don't need these senior services, but I am blessed that they're here when that time comes. Beyond that, I do have family members that may need them in short order, and I was checking with the people here this morning on some of the requirements and how those work, and it looked very beneficial for many people. Uh, the third thing is mental health. It's a bad, drastic need here in, well, in our county as well as our state, and that is something that this organization is addressing and working to help solve over the long term. Thank you very much. Our second question. Oregon Project Independence is a program that has kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? Uh, looking at the statistics that were provided me this morning when I was here, we can service about two and a half individuals on OPI versus on the other programs here that are subsidized by Medicaid and the federal government. So by staying with OPI, we are serving more of the public where there is a long waiting list right now to get into that service. The other three entities all have mandatory participation. They can't turn any of the employee or candidates down. So they're all being treated. It's the OPI that has the waiting list and needs the most attention. Thank you very much. Our third question, sir. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? That one is a little more hard to address. <laughs> but it's a good one. Uh, the majority of the housing situation on people with, in OPI, they need like residential care, not residential care centers, I mean group homes, where they can go into a home setting, still be part of society, and work with that. There should be a program, and maybe it is state directed, where there is education out to the public that are qualified to provide group homes. There's a lot of these homes out here with middle-aged people, not young people with young children and not old seniors that have multiple bedrooms that could take in a lot of these residents and help them through that. I think that's probably the best place to start. Thank you again. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Question four. So, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasingly senior and people with disabilities population? I look at this whole funding thing a little different than most people do. I'm a finance officer, or was, and I look at the chart provided me here where it costs $332 a month for a first level person in the program we've been talking about and we look into the other three programs which are federally funded, matched or as assisted and we can treat a lot more people at the lower end and we don't have a mandatory but with the mandatory we have to get the legislature to provide the money for that without rating the lower end. Thank you. Our last question. How will your experience, your life experience and business experience shape, shape the work that you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? Well, my entire business career has been as a executive in healthcare, specifically hospitals. Uh, I've worked in uh, with mentally and aged population most of my life, including uh, drug rehab at uh, Gateway Hospital up in Portland. This has given me an insight in the areas of 
dealing with these people and uh, providing them with the care they need. Much of it is training, but much of it is just day-to-day -day assistance to let them remain as independent functioning individuals and maintaining their personal self-respect. I think that's the most important factors. Well, thank you very much. We've actually finished our round of questionings, so I'd like to thank you very much, Mr. Jack L. S., <laughs> and I understand the L is important, uh, and wish you luck as you compete as Republican nominee for House District 21. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Colin. Hi, I'm Amador Aguilar, and this is Representative uh, Teresa Alonso Leon, incumbent uh, Democratic candidate for House District 22. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you for being here. Gracias, Amador. I appreciate being here. Gracias. Uh, I'm going to start with the questions. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you did for seniors and people with disabilities during your time in office. Well, um, I just first want to say that I'm blessed to live in Woodburn where many of our senior community come to retire. Um, I have had the privilege of take, talking to many um, people at the doors as I canvass and um, it helped me better understand what issues were important to them. Um, in my first session, I worked closely on issues that affect our elders and people with disabilities um, and as a member of the Healthcare Committee and the Ways and Means Human Services Committee. I've supported uh, legislation that, um, so that helps elderly and memory impaired Oregonians by improving the quality of long-term care services and long-term care referral services. Um, and then recently in 2018, I introduced legislation that allows for Oregonians to, um, to offer a prescription by mail through their pharmacy. Tell us uh, at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to reelect you. Yeah, um, I grew up in a family where you're taught to honor our elders and people with disabilities. So this means voters can expect me to honor everyone in Oregon. Um, first, I believe that elder abuse is a lot in our long-term care facilities is a serious problem, and our state needs to take serious actions to address it. Um, and I want to make sure that that um, that they hold abusers accountable. Um, secondly, I support efforts to ensure that caregivers are fairly compensated for their work, and that the state puts funding into it to make sure that um, that that they are compensated well. Finally, I believe that all Oregonians should be able to um, have a secure retirement. They work very hard for it um, so they can live out the years with dignity. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly um, cut. What did you do uh, to project current funding for OPI, and uh, if reelected, how you will ensure continued funding for this cost-effective program? As a legislator and a granddaughter of someone who um, uses a wheelchair, I have learned to appreciate the many challenges that our elder and people with disabilities um, experience. Uh, which has helped me to have a greater understanding about the important um, the importance to keep our constituents in their own homes. I've been a strong advocate to make sure that our elders and people with disabilities um, do stay in their own homes and get the support that they need. Uh, during the last session, I uh, fought for OPI to continue to get um, funding and when re-elected, you can count on me to make sure that I will continue to advocate on behalf of OPI so that we can, they can continue to get funding for services that are many of our community members deserve. Thank you. Please give us a two minutes overview of what you did in the past uh, legislative sessions to enhance service for seniors and people with disabilities. As a legislator, I wanna help Oregon move forward. This means that we need to focus on policies that help our elders and adults with disabilities uh, and working families and our children. 
there have been so many people that have, been, that have inspired me as I've knocked on the doors. And I want to share a quick story. Um, in my first uh, campaign, I knocked on a door and I heard a voice saying, come in. And we're taught not to go in. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, but, but I went ahead and opened the door and he said, uh, come on in, I can't come to you. And when I opened the door, I noticed that there was a gentleman who was bedridden in his dining room. Oh. And uh, we, we had the best conversation. And he shared with me how important it was for him to stay in his home as he healed and that um, the services that he was getting was just really important for him. So I better understood all the health um, needs that he needed and how to best support him. And those kinds of stories really inspired me to want to um, advocate on behalf of um, our elders and people with disabilities as a legislator. And um, that's what I have been doing since. Uh, and you can continue to count on me to be able to do that for everyone. Okay. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that uh, seniors and people with disability no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Yeah, and that is a, an important issue, and I've heard that at the doors as well. Um, I understand that many of our elders um, are on fixed incomes, so when um, they learn that they need to leave their homes because the owners of the house have decided to sell it. Um, it just it, it it makes me think about what is it that we need to do in policy. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to do is end no cause evictions and end rent spikes. Uh, our folks who are on a budget or fixed income um, can't afford to just up and leave whenever um, a homeowner decides that they want to want to um, rent out their house to somebody else or want to um, sell it. We need to have clear policies to help our most vulnerable. How would you prioritize a state funding, including funding that match with federal funds for service to increase in senior and people with disability population? So last year, I also had the opportunity to visit um, a uh, facility for um, folks with disabilities. And I got to learn um, the importance of that facility and how they bring people together and help, the, help folks in there um, uh, you know, feel comfortable and confident. And um, to me, it's just really important to continue to support programs like that. Um, Funding for critical services for our vulnerable population, including our elders and people with disabilities, is of great importance to me and for our state. Funding programs and services that are, that are matched with federal dollars is a top priority for me, and I think it makes great fiscal sense to be able to take opportunity of what we can leverage on the state level and federal funding to make sure that our programs um, continue to get the services that they deserve. Oh. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great information. And thank you uh, for you uh, joining us. And this is Representative Teresa Al uh, Leon, Alonso Leon, incumbent Democratic candidate for House District 22. Hi, I'm Cheryl Statz, and I'd like to welcome Marty Hyen, Republican and Independent candidate for House District 22. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with a disability to vote for you. Well, first of all, I'm pro-life, and not only from the pre-born, but to the very elderly. Every life is precious, whether they're fully able to do things, whether, whether they're disabled, it doesn't matter. They're all precious, and um, I, I support their, their right to live. Uh, second is kind of a personal issue is I do have elderly and disabled people in my family, in my immediate family. I don't want to name names, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble, um, but I understand some of the issues more than ever in the last couple years as I've experienced it with this family member. So I'll bring a personal understanding uh, to, to, le to the legislature. And you know, many of our seniors, they've led an active life in our community, they've, they've contributed to our society, and we owe it to them to help them in a time when they can't take care of themselves. 
And oh, oh my goodness, I'm almost out of time here. I <laughs> see. We know that uh, history judges those that don't treat their elders well. And I want history to look back on us and say we did a good job. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? I will vote against any cuts and I will vote for any increase in funding that we can get through the legislature. Um, I have again personal experience. I had grandmothers in two different states that were uh, allowed to stay in their homes. They had somebody come in. There was no family member close by to help take care of them. And my one grandmother was able to live in her home until a week and a half before she died. And that meant a lot to her. Uh, she was surrounded by things that make her comfortable. And uh, so she had a happy, happy retirement. Uh, my dad uh, wasn't so lucky and ended up in assisted living for the last six months of his life. Um, he didn't want to be there. He tried to escape several times and uh, I don't want that for anybody. Right, I understand. So what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Well, unfortunately, this is a crisis affecting all age groups. I know some young couples that uh, are trying to find a home. They were going out for a $160,000 home and they couldn't even find anything. People are bidding over, you know, outbidding what the sellers were asking for. So it, it's a definite problem that we have and it's because we don't have enough housing. And when you don't have a ho enough housing, then everything continues to rise. Like my family member, her rent rises every year by about $70, 70, yeah, $70 a month, which, you know, Social Security doesn't keep up with that mm -hmm. at all. So I would want to revisit land use laws and regulations and see what we can do to trim things back so that we can encourage more homes to be built because that's the solution. We need more housing. Okay, thank you. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, we have a moral responsibility to take care of our seniors and the disabled. Uh, so this would be a high priority, right up there with foster care, actually. You know, we have also uh, some, you know, we have a moral responsibility to take care of our children, you know, that aren't, aren't in their homes. I think both of these things are just as important. Um, any chance at matching funds with the federal government would be good as long as we can keep control. We really don't want to give our control to the federal government because we understand our local community better than they do. And I'm, I'm wondering about a, like a public-private partnership, maybe like we did it with a school district um, in Mountain West where we have SeaTech, which is a career and technical school. And it really didn't cost the school district very much because we had somebody, you know, that wanted to help the community contribute that. So maybe there's, there's something that can be done in that way. We also have record low unemployment. So I'm thinking we have more tax dollars, right? So we have to be smart about how we're using our tax dollars because we have the money. Okay, thank you. How will your experience shape the, wor the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? Well, I'll work for them like their own, my own family because they are actually, even here in Salem. Um, I'm 61 myself, you know, I could collect Social Security <laughs> next year if I wanted to. So I, you know, I'm gonna treat them like they're my own family. Uh, I, I've talked to people out there and uh, I've met some more people and heard some of the struggles they're having and there's lots of different issues. And I'm really glad to, to learn about this organization. I didn't know about it and how you're trying to help seniors. I think that's wonderful. And so I wanna encourage you guys and, and help you guys to help, to help our seniors. Um, and the other big thing is I have is for our veterans, our disabled and senior veterans, they need to be helped as well. And I'm sure you work with many of those as well. Thank you. 
Thank you for being here, Marty. This is Marty Hyen, Republican candidate for House and District 22. Hi, I'm Linda Crandall, and I'd like to welcome Danny Jaffer, the Democratic, Independent, and Pacific Green candidate for House District 23. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Can you tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you? Well, sure. Number one, uh, I believe very strongly in education and I believe in career and technical education and we need to uh, prioritize that in a way that we are providing education in uh, senior, disabled, elder care and uh, providing those skills to the uh, uh, younger people in the population who may be interested in that. And we also uh, also feel like uh, my emphasis on health care is quite large. All Oregonians are entitled, in my opinion, to uh, quality, affordable health care. And uh, that helps take the burden off of everyone, including senior and disabled. And also, uh, uh, I'm, uh, as a veteran, I'm very concerned about veterans care. And I think that that's a position I hold uh, with a lot of uh, um, feeling and, and desire to make sure that we're providing those sorts of uh, uh, that levels of care that, that our veterans have earned and deserve. Thank you for that. Oregon Project Independence is a program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? OPI is a, a great way to help keep seniors and disabled in the, their homes. I think that that's something we need to continue and I would uh, do everything I can to make sure that we continue funding that through the legislature. Uh, and this is not a partisan issue. This is not Republican, Democrats, Greens, whatever. This is about uh, taking care of the folks who are vulnerable and keeping them in their homes if we can because we know that uh, uh, when people can remain in a place they're familiar, both their economic and their mental health are served. And uh, so I'd work across the aisle and I would make sure that we are uh, providing the kind of services that, uh, th that again, seniors and disabled and others in the vulnerable populations uh, deserve. Great. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer lack uh, face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Well, this is a, this is a big question throughout the state and uh, throughout the country even, but uh, in rural areas, you know, we see it as acutely as they do in urban areas. And uh, one of the things that, and as we were talking about OPI, keeping people in a place that, where they're familiar, allowing folks to stay in their homes that they've already paid for uh, is very beneficial to their economic health. and. Uh, one of the things that I think we can do in the legislature is provide ways that uh, even when folks are trying to stay in, in a place they're familiar, when they uh, have incidences of not being able to get to medical appointments or even to the grocery store, you know, we see that a lot in the rural areas where clinics and grocery stores have moved to other places or have shut down where they're at. We need to be able to provide the transportation, and I think that the legislature can work uh, very hard hand in hand with other organizations to provide that kind of transportation so that we can get people to those appointments and to those uh, to, to the other vital services that they need and still allow them to stay in their homes. Thank you. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Uh, well, obviously the, uh, the, the place where you're at is where you need to be served. Um, so we need to prioritize that capability. Uh, you know, there's the basic needs, shelter, um, uh, nutrition, healthcare. So we need to make sure that those services are being provided and we also need to make sure that they're accessible. So I believe that uh, the legislature can make that a priority when we prioritize the most vulnerable amongst us, be it children, senior, disabled, elderly, 
uh, then we're doing our part as a moral society. How will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? Well, I spent uh, nearly 25 years in the military, and one of the things I learned there, regardless of your rank, uh, a lot of people have a lot of good ideas. And I believe that we need to keep our ears open, sometimes keep our mouths shut, and listen to what people have to say. Listen to the folks who are working in that particular issue, in that particular industry, if you will. Uh, get the ideas that, that make sense, and uh, don't turn a blind eye to those that uh, you think might be coming from someone who may not be your ally, because at the end of the day, it's about providing the services that we as a state should be providing, and we as human beings should want to provide. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your viewpoints with us. Thank you, I appreciate it. We have been talking with Democratic candidate, independent and Pacific Green, Danny Jaffer, who is candidate for House District 23. Hi, I'm Heather Wechter and I'd like to welcome Dave McCall, Democratic candidate for House District 25. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, thank you. Tell us at least three of the positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you. Well, I'm a firm believer that our government is, de is designed in order to help the individuals and their communities as a whole. I have a particular interest in schools and our seniors. So I would like to see more services available to those who actually need them because these people are really the ones that are the most uh, vulnerable in our society. Okay. Oregon Project Independence is a program that has kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes. Yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? Well, it's more than cost-effective. It's also a, a benefit that serves a particular purpose that helps our individuals, our seniors, those with disabilities. My mother is one of these, and she relies upon me in order to help her quite often. I would work for our uh, state government, which is designed to help it is the fulcrum of our entire governmental system. So it should have a bigger role to play in helping and therefore fund fully this vital particular um, project. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? Oh, this is a good one. I particularly have an interest in this, and one of the problems is the statewide ban that the state legislature put in on our locality, our local governments from being able to institute such things as rent control or other rent systems. It is a ban, it, it's a ban that affects the entire state, and it keeps local governments our cities, our counties, from being able to have the flexibility to ha uh, if there's a local need to put something like that in. So we need to remove that ban and let locals decide on their own. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that's matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior population and people with disabilities? Well, I think it should be one of our top priorities. Along with our schools, our seniors and those with disabilities should receive the most amount of help from our government that is possible. Now, we have budgetary constraints. We have limits. There's a limit to the amount of money. So it comes to how do we balance our budget but do it in a different priority? So yes, I would look very close at some of the projects that, are do that we're doing and see if money can be moved more to schools, seniors, and those with disabilities. 
How will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? Mike's personal experience has been one that I have a mother in her 70s who struggles because she has only a single income and it's limited. I have two nephews who are also dis uh, disabled and it's long-term disablement. And so I see this personally happening. I have neighbors also who are like me, getting into the age where we're going to be in the same boat. I believe in a system, in a community, that we're all in the same boat together. Mm -hmm. We all want to be able to have what it is that we strive for in our lives, uh, whether that be uh, professional success or it be uh, personal success. But when it comes down to the basics, we should look out for each other and do what we can in order to help everybody. <laughs> Well, thank you for your input and time. Well, I thank you very much. It's been enjoyable. <laughs> for me, too. Uh, we've been talking to Dave McCall, Democratic candidate for House District 25. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Crandall, and I'd like to welcome Tiffany Mitchell, Democratic candidate for House District 32. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you, I appreciate you inviting me to take the time to come out and, and say hello. So, Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you. So a big part of my campaign is really making sure that regular people have a voice in the legislature um, because that's not typically the demographic that ends up running. Um, and that includes making sure that we stand up for people who suffer with disabilities or people who um, you know, are older and really need that additional help. I want to make sure that we're able to help them. So t three of my top issues are making sure first and foremost that we stand up for health care and protect health care for everybody here in the state making sure that housing is affordable and that we really address the housing crisis, and then also finding stable funding for education. Um, all of these are really important, I think, in making sure that we have a competent workforce that can take care of people um, who you know, take advantage of services through Northwest Seniors and Disabilities, um, making sure that healthcare is affordable and accessible, accessible for people, and that also people can stay in their homes and not have to worry about what their housing situation is going to look like when they get older. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. What, do you do, what will you do to ensure and protect funding for this cost-effective program? I think that some of the big things that I can do is make sure, A, that I really advocate for the program. As someone who grew up um, with a single mother and my grandparents, um, I am really cognizant of the continued contributions that older people make to society and that we need to make sure that people can stay in their own homes and, and really continue to, to live those productive lives. Um, and I think even from a fiscal perspective, when we look at what the state ends up saving by really trying to make sure that people are able to, to stay in their own homes through the Oregon Project Independence Program, um, it, it's a lot cheaper and makes a whole lot of sense. And so people can count on me to make sure that I stand up for that because I know it's the right thing to do. Thank you. What will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing? So there are a couple things that I think that we can do. Um, first and foremost, I think that um, we can ensure that on a state level we are fighting to make sure that laws get passed or we remove the encumbrances for local municipalities that really make it hard for them to make housing more affordable. We can build more affordable housing. Um, and just ensure that we are making sure that all resources necessary are going into those programs because it's hard for people who are working to afford housing. It's got to be a lot harder for people who are living on a fixed income. Um, I want to make sure that people don't have to worry in their later years about whether or not they have to face housing instability as well as for people who also have disabilities so that they don't have to worry about that either. So, Thank you. 
How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Um, so I know that there are certain laws already that kind of prioritize that for us, but at the same time, when we look at our budgets, um, the budget is really a value statement for what we here in Oregon really care about. And when we consider that we have to care about the people who live here first and foremost, um, I think it's important that we make sure that that funding prioritizes making sure that people who need additional assistance in their homes that are homebound, that need food to, to be delivered to them, that we make sure that that's available, um, that we have meal sites avail available for folks, and that we also have assistance to really help make sure that people are getting the services that they need. Um, and like I said, I will be an advocate for that in the legislature to make sure that that people have those continued services and don't have to worry about um, facing shortfalls in, in their ability to live comfortably. Thank you. How will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? So for me, my experience over the last 10 years of my life has been in, in social services. Um, I worked for the unemployment insurance department in the state of Utah. I worked for child welfare here in Oregon and I now work for self-sufficiency for DHS. Um, for me, my whole life has been about working in positions that really seek to help people going through the hardest times in their lives. And having seen that and really wanting to stand up for those people and making sure that everybody has a, a good and fair chance, especially in situations where we need to ensure greater equity to, to disadvantaged populations, um, that is something that is very close to my heart and something that I really care about and will make sure that that is a priority for me to stand up for, for everybody once I get elected. Thank you, mm -hmm. and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and share your viewpoints with us. It's not a problem at all. Thank you for having me. I really ha appreciate the, the ability to get out and tell people what I really think is important. So thank you for having me. We've been talking with Tiffany Mitchell, Democratic candidate for House District 32. Hi, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Vanita Lauer, Republican candidate for the House District 32. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us at least three of your positions that would encourage a senior mm -hmm. or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think we need to recognize that they're a, a vulnerable and valuable um, population and I would like to make sure, for example, my mother's just been in and out of the hospital and I want to make sure that there's a, there's a cap to the medical um, expenditures, you know, for she goes into the hospital for three days and then she's out for two days and goes back for two days and that's, you know, her insurance just doesn't cover it as well as if it was consecutive and so I want to make sure that that's not a burden for them as well as um, ensuring that the services that they need are available to them with qualified employees. Yes. Bonita, Oregon Project Independence is a program that has kept seniors mm -hmm. and people with disabilities mm -hmm. in their own home, mm -hmm. yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. Yeah. What will you do to ensure and protect the funding for this cost-effective program? My brother-in-law actually does that for Washington State with the disability, and so I've got, you know, a little bit of knowledge, not much, but I just think it's so valuable for them to be able to be in an, their own home or even at least rooming with somebody in their own home as opposed to being institutionalized. And so I th the um, Oregon uh, Project Independ Independence has, uh, is very valuable. It's very important mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that it's, uh, uh, that it's kept going. Hmm. Yes, thank you. What will you do on a state level mm -hmm. so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face the lack of accessible and affordable housing? Well, that's one thing, uh, encouraging the, uh, you know, where they can room together and share housing is, is uh, you know, and having that companionship is one way. And another way is looking at different possibilities of, uh, it, cutting expenses for them, um, maybe some red tape, 
that's something I need to look more into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds for services to an increasing senior and people with disability population? You know, all, the money all kind of goes into a pot and making sure that all of the pots get um, filled is going to be a challenge and I can tell you that that is definitely going to be a priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. How will your experience shape the work you will do on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities? You know, like I said, they're a vulnerable, valuable group, especially with the baby boomers um, coming up, and I'm mm -hmm. at the tail end of that. <laughs> so um, it, I want to make sure that, that we're taken care of, you know, especially, well, with seniors, they put so much of themselves into our society and into our funding with their taxes that they've already paid. They, they deserve to be taken care of and valued. Um, and those with disabilities, they're certainly not their fault that they're disabled and they need to, um, they're ne they, they need to be taken care of mm -hmm. and have the resources that they need. They need qualified employees, they need, um, you know, and qualified employees that can be provided an income so that they can, they can have their own homes and their own, provide for their own families. And so it expands out not, not just to them, but to their employees that are providing the services. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Vanita. This is Vanita Lauer, Republican candidate for the House District 32. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. I want to thank the candidates on behalf of the members of Northwest Senior and Disability Services Senior Advisory Council and Disability Services Advisory Council for attending our candidate interviews. Copies of these interviews can be checked out from Northwest Senior and Disability Services by calling 503-304-3451. We hope the information that has been provided will help you make informed choices when you vote. The opinions expressed here are not endorsed by Northwest Senior and Disability Services. For more information, about Northwest Senior and Disability Services, call 1-866-206-4799. The Advisory Councils for Northwest Senior and Disability Services would like to thank CCTV for their production of the forum. Thank you for watching.